Please stand. I hold the flag salute. Thank you. Thank you very much. Happy New Year, everybody. Thank you for having me back. Um, just wanted to touch on uh, what we did last December. Uh, it was a really busy uh, month for us. Uh, statewide, we were at 900 drunk drivers, which is a huge uh, spike upward. Uh, we actually saw that number go up in our area as well. Um, one of our big concerns right now is uh, marijuana. Obviously, uh, we're, we're concerned there's going to be some more uh, intoxicated drivers out there. Um, the laws really haven't changed. It's always been illegal to drive under the influence of marijuana. There's no presumptive limit yet. Um, that's something the California Highway Patrol is working on developing for the state over the next 12 months. Uh, states like Colorado have a presumptive limit, um, which uh, if you're familiar with the alcohol DUI laws, 0.08% is the presumptive limit. So if you're at 0.08, you're intoxicated when you're chill. With uh, marijuana, we have to call a drug recognition expert, and it's a little bit subjective, and we have a hard time um, getting some DAs on board to actually prosecute those cases. So um, there are a few different organizations, uh, one of the uh, UCs, and I think Texas Instruments, you know, for making calculators. They're working on uh, roadside tests where they can do either a cheek swab, they can check the number of uh, nanograms, which is the uh, quantitative amount that uh, organizations such as the Colorado State Patrol uses to measure the amount of uh, THC, uh, which is in the bloodstream not for smoking marijuana. So that's something that'll be developed. So our big message this year is DUI doesn't just mean booze, obviously it means marijuana, and, and additionally prescription medication. So just a reminder to everybody who takes pre prescription meds, make sure you check on there. It says do not operate heavy machinery. Um, that would include a vehicle. That's pretty heavy machinery, so don't drive while uh, taking your prescription medication. We do, we do actually have a high number of people. Um, it's actually a national issue, um, especially with all the uh, opioid epidemic uh, going on. There's a lot of people using their prescription medication and they're getting arrested for DUI, they're using their own driving, they're taking their own prescription. So make a choice to either take those prescription meds that say don't drive, or drive and don't take them. But just make sure you don't do both. We don't want to see anybody get hurt or killed. Um, just uh, case in point on the marijuana um, the DUI, it's such a big deal because so many young people think that it doesn't affect them that, that, well, um, that badly. And marijuana, when combined with um, alcohol, it actually has a compounding effect. It actually makes it significantly worse for the driver. As uh, anybody here who watches the news probably saw, one of our officers, the CHP Hayward, Officer Camillary, was killed on Christmas Eve driver who was under the influence of alcohol and marijuana. Singularly, if that driver had had just the alcohol or just the marijuana, he may not have been under the influence, but the two combined had a compounded effect, which made it significantly worse. So that's something to, uh, a message to share with your loved ones, especially with the younger generation. They don't seem to get the correlation of um, marijuana. They don't think it's that bad. Uh, like some of the some of the rest of us who've grown up knowing that you shouldn't smoke and drive, they don't think it affects them that bad. Especially now that it's legal, I think it's okay. Now that I beat a dead horse on that, um, I just wanted to let everybody know we are uh, up and running on social media. If anybody wants to follow the Sanity Springs CHP area, we're on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Um, you can find out what uh, events we're, we're uh, involved in. Like today, we're at uh, Cerritos Fire Station 30. With Cerrito sheriffs and Supervisor Hahn and a few others um, for the West Coast First uh, Mobile Stroke Unit. And that's going to be accessible, if I understand correctly, Lauren, to, for most of District 4, right? Uh, mobile Stroke Unit. Okay. I, I know that it's going to be stationed, I think, going back and forth between Santa Monica and Long Beach. But right now it is in District 4. That's one of the things that we put out there. Um, other things you can find out are just information we share like today um, on social media. Uh, just reminders people, slow down. First rainy of the season, a lot of oil up on the roadway. Um, and then other news stories like, did anybody here see the, uh, our why the chickens cross the road last week? With all the big national news. Nobody? You guys watch the news? All right, we had, a, we, we had about 20 chickens on the 605 freeway that caused all lanes to come to a stop now. <laughs> 
got every major news organization out there. It went viral online and all kinds of funny puns, like the, chicken, the chickens were too chicken to fight and whatnot. But um, anyway, if you guys are interested, follow us on Facebook. It's uh, CHP Santa Fe Springs, obviously. Twitter is uh, at CHP underscore SFS. And then our Instagram is at CHP. It's a little longer. Underscore Santa underscore Fe underscore Springs. You can blame my captain for that one. I had nothing to do with that. It was a little long. Um, something that we also do with social media is just to, uh, for you guys to be able to communicate with us on an easier platform. Uh, the last meeting I was here, I don't remember which gentleman I was talking to, said there was a tree um, blocking uh, their street on the way over here. And I, I called the county roads, and within three minutes of me calling, they're actually out there clearing the tree out. We put the, took a picture of it, showed the CHP partner with LA County Roads, and that got a whole lot of attention. So that's another way that we can use social media, and that you guys can you know, respond to us if you don't have the traditional means of being able to just pick up the telephone if you're at work or something on your computer and you want to shoot us a message, you can get a hold of us that way. Um, also, traffic complaints. Um, if you guys have complaints, obviously we're here to take them. I just ask that you be uh, courteous and understanding. I did take one uh, rather nasty complaint from a Rolling Heights resident today. Um, I won't name him. Um, but not to make excuses, but uh, just to give you some quick stats. In the 1950s, there were about 5,000 California Highway Patrolmen for a population of about 10 million people in the state of California. It's about one officer for every 2,000 people. And compared to an urban city area, I think most departments are probably about one officer to every 500 or 1,000 residents. So we're already at half to quarter the manpower. Fast forward to 2018, we're at about 40 million people in California, and our department's only grown 50%. We're at 7,500 officers. That puts us at about one officer for every 5,300 people. So when we say that we're a little understaffed, we're not lying to you, we're telling you the truth. We are understaffed, but we will do our best to service this area. I understand that Cleveland and Fullerton is a really, really bad area. Um, a lot of traffic jams, that was the main complaint. And um, there was actually, let me grab my binder here, uh, the Walton family sent me an email, I think about a month ago, regarding um, a really interesting website, if any of you guys want to write it down. It's uh, interactive. It actually gives some statistics for collisions. And I'm just gonna read this real quick if, uh, if you guys don't mind. Uh, this was from uh, Terry Malkin. Um, in addition to the most dangerous time to be driving on an LA freeway, the most dangerous spot is where the 57 and 60 freeways meet, with an average of 168 accidents taking place there in three years. This two mile area known as well by the San Diego Valley commuters, and also by first responders as the Bermuda Triangle, <laughs> because everybody gets lost there and doesn't know which freeway they're on. It, they're both the same. They're both 57 and 60. Um, it merges 17 lanes into 14, so obviously that's a problem. According to the survey, confusing signage and it being a popular route for semi-trucks are also part of the problem. It's safe to say that being at the 57 and 60 interchange on a Friday between 5 to 7 is not the safest of choices. Other dangerous intersections are at Kalima and Fullerton Roads. Kalima Road and Nogales Street, South Hacienda Boulevard and Gale, and South Vermont and Sepulveda, which is on the other side of LA. So uh, it looks like three of those four are right out here in this area, and I'm sure that's not news to any of you guys. Um, there's a really interesting uh, uh, link here, so if you guys want to, if anyone wants to uh, write it down, let me know and I'll, I'll read it out here. Anybody interested? It has like interactive charts here, there's a dashboard on there, you can track the number of stats. That's run by the California Highway Patrol. And every police agency in the state of California orders or collisions to us. And we track every single accident that has happened that's been reported to the police. And I'm pretty sure that we have a lot more than 168 accidents in three years. I would say we probably had to make a few months at that, that area. So just be careful when you are in that area. But uh, I'm gonna read Hello, Newman's office. Happy New Year. It's 2018, so I hope you guys have a great start to your year. Um, so last week was the state legislature's first week back in session. 
So uh, we're looking at new bills, we're looking to propose new bills, so this is the time where we're starting fresh in the new legislative session. So um, you should, if you have access to the internet, you should check out um, the you should check out legginfo.com if you want to look at what the legislature is proposing this year for new bills. Um, and for our office, an event that we're doing coming up in March is our annual Woman of the Year event. So we're asking for local community members to nominate women in your community that you feel like have made a difference and um, have really helped to make our community thrive. So we have nine categories um, to honor the women in our district. Um, some of them include arts, business, community service, and things like that. Um, so I encourage you to go to our website, which uh, if, if you just Google State Senator Josh Newman, it's probably the easiest way to find our website. Um, but you can also follow us on Facebook if you need the link to nominate a woman. Uh, the only thing we're asking is to not nominate an elected official. Otherwise, uh, I'm sure you guys all know a woman in your life who has helped make a difference, so that would be great if you can nominate her. And um, if you wanted a quick recap, recap of last year's legislative session for us, we introduced 11 bills and all of them were signed by the governor, so we were fortunate enough to have that support. Um, if you wanted to ask about specific bills, feel free to come find me afterwards and I can tell you about them. Yes. Uh, the most specific bill we're all interested in, and I haven't seen anything in the news about it, is that constitutional amendment lockbox so that the uh, our fine elected officials can't raid that tax money that we're paying on the gasoline. What's the status on that? So that is actually, so it's been passed in the legislature, but it's going to come to the voters because it is a constitution constitutional amendment, so you guys have to vote on it. But I strongly encourage you to vote on it because that would... Effectively, say like the gentleman has said, it would. Uh, so the new taxes that are raised as part of the transportation package, we wouldn't be allowed to redirect any of that money away from transportation. So all that money would stay for the the purpose it was for for transportation. So um, that's going to come up on, I believe, the June ballot. It's either June or November, but um, it is going to be on the ballot. So if you see it, I strongly encourage you to vote. Uh, there, we have some copies of the petition to uh, overturn the gas tax. They're present over here on the table, so if anyone is interested in that, they have to be in by Thursday. So if you are opposed to it, and you want to sign that petition, make sure to do it tonight. And leave it, and we'll see that it gets nailed in. Are there any other questions? Mm -hmm. Oh, yes, so... That's what the petition is for. She, she's asking about marijuana. Oh. Yes, so so that was a ballot measure that the um, that you guys voted in. So if you wanted to overturn that, there would be another ballot measure to overturn that. We can't overturn it. We'll, we'll speak more about that uh, a little later. <laughs> we have a speaker on what's being proposed. Any more questions for Angie? Okay. Thank you very much. Yes, if you have a question for any of the speakers, please step out to the middle aisle and Lynn will have a, a microphone right there for you. Uh, I'm a little ahead of myself here on the agenda. I skipped right over our town sheriff, Tony Gonzalez. I mean to insult you. Hello, everybody. All right, once again, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into December here few happening that were in December. It's not real long this month. So uh, let's start on the 13th. We have deputies that were patrolling. Um, once again, you guys hear this a lot. Uh, deputies patrolling the parking lot at Motel 6. No, uh, no. And uh, the, reason, the reason a lot of our deputies go there, as you, most of you know, we've been having a lot of burglary problems. Well, a lot of our burglars go to Motel 6. <laughs> that's where they're, they're based out of. So we do get a lot of stolen stuff out of there. They were patrolling Motel 6 on Laban Court and they contacted a female for a vehicle violation. And she had just driven into the parking lot. They learned that the female driver was on parole for ID theft and assault. 
They searched her car and they found methamphetamine, counterfeit credit cards, pages and pages of ID theft info, burglary tools, <laughs> and several high-end purses. A female passenger was also arrested and she had a high dollar warrant. Let's see, 1220, deputies were driving southbound on Ogallis Street and Colima Road when they noticed a vehicle making an illegal U-turn. They stopped the vehicle and they found that the driver's license was suspended. Both the driver and the female passenger were removed from the vehicle so it could be safely searched. And inside the vehicle, deputies found again meth pipes, meth, credit cards, and other people's names, a social security card belonging to somebody else, and several pages of ID belonging to other people. And last but not least, we have uh, deputies that were driving north on Fullerton Road from Colima Road, and they saw an older Crown Vic, Crown Victoria, four-door sedan, like our police cars. And it had no license plates and old spotlights on it. And the windows, windows were also very tinted, so they stopped it to possibly cite for the infractions. The driver was wearing a tan law enforcement type uniform and a badge with California Department of Safety on it. Uh, deputies noticed that the driver was very nervous and he denied possessing any weapons. They had the driver exit the vehicle and during the search of the vehicle they found a loaded 45 semi-auto gun and a taser. Further research later revealed that the driver had used a past employee's info to obtain the gun. And the driver is now pending a court case. He bonded out and he's pending a court case right now. So I'll keep you guys updated on that and see where that goes. All right, any questions out there for me? We'll start off one. Uh, there was a wreck at the corner of Valen and Brea Canyon cut up earlier this week, I mean, yesterday or the day before, the overturned car. You know anything about that one? traffic stop uh, at the time, and uh, I think that was yeah. about yeah. One, o'clock, yeah. one o'clock or so, and we heard it, and we looked back, and I was with my two partners, and uh, it was a female who was making a left, who got flipped by a car going southbound, and overturned. The female was pregnant in the overturned car, so they transported her. Just a one-on-one -on -one traffic Did she appear to be hurt? Um, she was, was already gone from the scene when I went by. Yeah, my partners were there. I never made it up there. I was on the traffic scene. Any questions? Any more questions out there? I'd like to know if somebody got hurt. Wait, come, come on up and ask the questions. Oh, please wait. I can talk really no, come on up. <laughs> I'm trying to organize it better. People behind you can't hear you. You're talking loud enough to come this way. Yeah. I want to know, um, tonight there were two accidents within just a really short time on Pathfinder and just one car hit one of those wooden poles that they have for the horses. And I'm wondering if somebody really got hurt because our whole front end was in, kaput. I heard, I heard the call go out. I didn't respond to it. Um, when did Wayne uh, drive? When did Wayne get on a drive slow? CHP, CHP no, are actually the guys that uh, investigate crash in Roland Heights. He said he's going to investigate it. Come on up and ask your question. I was just wondering about um, home invasion and gang. We haven't, we haven't had any home invasions lately, I can remember. And uh, gangs. We, uh, the team that I work on, we are the gang, the gang team at the station. Um, they've been fairly quiet lately. A lot of them have been put in prison. In prison right now. Usually I, uh, they're on my report, my monthly report if we contact them. There is. I was uh, concerned about that accident over by Stater Brothers, uh, where I think a car ran into a tree there and then some parts went over to the restaurant? I saw the crash site. I wasn't working. And again, I, we don't investigate those. CHP investigates those. Do you know anything about that one? I don't know. Do you have any specific questions about an um, accident? Feel free to give me a call and I can look up any details that I can. A lot of times that information cannot be released to anybody other than to what parties to the collision or their insurance agents or whatever. 
um, speaking of home invasions and all of that, there's an app or a couple apps going on. Uh, Nextdoor.com, et cetera. Hello, Nice Buzz. Okay. There are some neighbors posting some different things, but with regard to like car burglaries and those sorts of things, some of them have caught pictures with using like ring or those sorts of. Do you guys have any recommendations of a good like home security ring is better than Acme widgets or something? I was just curious. I would get something. I can't recommend anything. Uh, yeah, I would get something. Something for your doorbell, maybe. And, yeah, security system in your house. Yeah, but I can't. I can't recommend a certain service. Any updates on getting some of these porch pirates who've been hitting our community? No, um, I say no. But uh, usually, if they're caught, we catch them right then and there, red-handed, or they've just left and we catch them with a package in their vehicle. Again, if, if we do catch them, I'll have it in my report. Those are, those are good arrests. Hi. Um, so we, our car got um, hit and one in front of our house, and then like uh, right. we called the you said yeah, it and then um, the people flee the scene, <coughs> and then we um, call the police, but we don't get like the specific license plate. But we got like um, anonymous letter from someone witnessed this accident, and they provide the full name and full address for it. And then we were asking whether um, the police can search the place for us, but um, I never received a response. And then after like two weeks, um, the police respond um, was saying like um, you can't keep calling me back because you don't have a specific license plate. In this case, what should I do with that? Okay. Did you call the Sheriff's Department or did you call CHP? Um, I believe it's the patrolling um, place that I call. If it was a traffic accident, hit and run, or CHP would be the uh, responding agency. Okay, because um, there's like a um, thing that we received that they said we have to contact with the police that respond with this accident. So yeah. that's why I'm If you want, see me see me after the meeting and I'll okay. write some stuff down and I'll, I'll get a hold of Jeremy and we'll figure out. Thank you. Out. Any other questions? Thank you, Tony. Have a good night. Mobile stroke unit on the west in the western United States. So I do have a list of, of the areas that that it does cover. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't cover Roland Heights yet, but in Cerritos, the unincorporated Whittier, and uh, Long Beach. So this is this is something that the supervisor hopes will be uh, one day anyone in the county can be treated by a mobile stroke unit no matter where they are in LA County. It is a pilot program, and uh, she was very proud to, to launch it today. And if you're not familiar, what it can do is it's a mobile unit that can go out and treat and diagnose stroke victims in the field. So it's something that's very exciting. Response times are very critical, so it's something that's potentially life-saving. Something else the supervisor has done last year, she worked on the uh, a feasibility study. So this is something uh, that she did through a motion she asked the county to look at the feasibility of studying rent control for mobile home parks in the unincorporated areas. She heard from residents from Roland Heights Mobile uh, Homes and they came to her wanting fair treatment and wanting help with dealing with rent increases. So this is something that the county is looking at right now, we're waiting for a report back. I got an update today, and they're hoping uh, to release the results of the study in about two weeks. So I wanted to let you know about that. And this was done in conjunction with, with residents, so stakeholder input was included. So for Roland Heights, Roland Heights will once again be participating in the homeless count. And if you're not familiar, this is something that is run by the LA Homeless Services Authority. It helps to provide a more accurate count of the 
homeless in our community and ultimately will provide uh, better solutions for the county addressing the crisis of homelessness. So if you're interested in signing up for the count, it will be Tuesday, January 23rd, 7 p.m. here at the Roland Heights Community Center. If you're interested in signing up, you can go to LASA's website and I will leave flyers or pass flyers around in case you are um, interested in, in volunteering on that night and we do encourage you to do so. And last but not least, a special announcement that the community has been very patient as we are anticipating the grand reopening of the Roland Heights Library. So the I have the official flyer invitations with me that I'll pass around. It will be Wednesday, February 7th at 3.30 at the library. Supervisor Han will be there to cut the ribbon and welcome everyone to the 21st Century Library. So I spoke with the library today and it's very exciting. So there will be a lot of upgrades and when you go into the library it will look completely different. There will be a reading library, a meeting room, the parking lot has been uh, repaved and there will be some additional parking spots and better traffic flow within the parking lot. So it's just a lot of really exciting things and we're, we want to invite you to the grand reopening. The library will be open on that day, so there will be programming and uh, we invite you to the ceremony at 3.30. And some of you may be familiar that there is a temporary library for now. Um, and that library will actually, over at uh, Carolyn Rosa's Park. So that temporary library will close on February 1st, and uh, that will allow the staff to get ready for move from there into the, the actual library. So those are all the announcements that I have, and if anyone has any questions, I'd be happy to take your questions. Question, come up to the mic, please. The, the meeting on the 23rd is the, the homeless count. So the, the volunteer day for Roland Heights is, is January 23rd at 7 p.m. here at the community center. And then if you want to volunteer, you would need to sign up. And uh, you can sign up on LASA's website. Lauren, what, uh, if someone volunteered for that, how much time are they committing to? You're signing up at 7, or they just go out? Or yes. Or what? Yes. It's it's a it's a couple hours. I, I did it last year, and we were I think they had it set until about 10 p.m. But I, our my car you go out in cars, and I think we were done by maybe 9:30, 9 o'clock. Go ahead. Okay, Ms. Yoko Mizu regarding our massage parlor. And I noticed the last meeting we had last month that we had all these uh, uh, people commenting on the massage parlor, but nobody could. And they were talking about oh. Uh, human trafficking, but well, what is it all about? It's the prostitution. Okay, that's what it's all about. Let's get the word out there, people. Massage parlor is synonymous with prostitution. And the one we have over at Stater Brothers there, uh, it has been acknowledged that uh, your person in charge of that, uh, Mr. Hamlet, I mess up his name, okay, uh, did not post the sign per the regulation that he sent out to all of us, but he did post them all over uh, Roland Heights on Colima and so forth, and the signs are still up. When are they going to come down? He said he's going to instruct his people to take them down, but the question is when, because it's blighting our community. So we need to get your departments to comply with their own regulations and take the signs down in a timely manner and not blight this community. That's item one. Thanks very much, Roy. Um, I want to address so two things that you brought up. So one is the matter of human trafficking. Yes, I can let you know. I um, yes, I'd be happy to. One more last question here. Getting back to the library, it's so uh, long in from when it was supposed to be done. My question is, what impact was this on the budget? Were because of the delays? I mean. Can you speak to like our? It, it didn't go over budget. And how and what? Why did it take so long? 
Yeah, thanks for, thank you very much for that question. So one of the uh, big reasons why there was a delay, the construction of the parking lot was taking longer than expected. So that caused um, a, a delay. I don't know as far as how it impacted the budget. I haven't heard anything that it has, but I'll, I'll double check if, if you're interested in knowing if it went over budget. As far as I know, I haven't heard anything that it, that it did impact. Okay, Lauren, thank you very much. Uh, moving right along, uh, I didn't see Judy Chen Hedrick here, but we do have Mr. Donald Sachs, the uh, assistant, assistant to the president of the school. Say a few words about Mount Sack. Good evening. Happy New Year to everybody. I've left some publications on the front desk up here. This has a wealth of information. If you have young people in the house, high school seniors, young people that are out of high school but maybe thinking about going back to school, this would be a wealth of information for them. Also, the first of the year was the beginning where the first year of community college throughout the state of California would be covered the $46 per unit. It's normally around $1,400 for a year. That money will not be available to the latter part of the year, and the college is addressing that now. We have about 71% of our student body that is on financial aid. And the question I had to the president at a meeting today, will that also account for buying books and other equipment that you're going to need? Because those are expensive items also. And he says there would be monies available once the state cuts loose with that. <laughs> I've mentioned to you in the past that we have now five bachelor programs provided through Mount San Antonio College. And a bachelor program, if you've had anybody go through a university, is an expensive item. That bachelor degree through Mount SAC, taught on Mount SAC campus by representation from Laverne University, Southern Illinois University, and St. Mary's is around $10,000. So there is a comfort level there, there's a convenience level there, and we just found out that from the five that we had, it is now up to nine, and we're hoping by July there will be 13 bachelor programs that we'll be offering through Mount San Antonio College. The way that works is Laverne University provides us the curriculum, it's taught on our campus. Any questions? Have a good evening. One question. Taught on your campus by somebody from Laverne? Our instructors utilizing their curriculum, but the certificate will come from the university. Very good, thank you. And that'll save uh, a lot of money for some students. Sure. Okay, last but not least, the Roller Unified School District, David Malcolm. Happy New Year, everybody. Um, I'm excited about having a 21st century library to go along with our 21st century school district. So we have a nice match now. Um, I don't know if a lot of you um, realize that uh, the school calendars have changed quite a bit from when we were in school. That uh, during Christmas vac vacation or winter break, the kids are off for three weeks now. Um, during Easter, uh, during um, spring break, they're off for a, um, a week. Uh, Thanksgiving, they're off a week. So those are large breaks of time that students are away. And you can imagine when you were a kid and you came back to school after being off for two weeks, what it was like. Coming back after three weeks, it's difficult. So um, our kids came back today after a three week break. And to kind of ease that, we did a new pilot program this, um, this year for the winter break. And what we did is we provided um, an extended learning opportunities during that break. So the students could attend some fun learning activities to keep them in the learning group while they were off. And a couple of those learning activities, one was makerspace. And everybody's gonna think, what's makerspace? I found out in education, they have their own language. Makerspace is kind of like DIY, do it yourself, and education coming together. They get a group of students together, they give them a bunch of supplies, and they give them a challenge, or they give them a problem to solve with those supplies. And that's um, it's a very creative way of learning and working together as a group. So we had a makerspace uh, workshop, we had a 3D printing workshop, and we had robotics. And we also incorporated with all that writing strategies around the Winter Olympics that would be coming up. So it was a lot of learning opportunities during the winter break, and this is for upper elementary school students. 
So we're not talking about college or we're not talking about high school students. We're talking about elementary school students that are doing this type of learning. Very creative. And we got a lot of positive response and we hope to expand it next year during the winter break and also during the summer break, we hope to expand it. Um, we're working on the um, summer school right now and registration for 2018-2019 school year will begin on February 5th. Now, if you know anybody that's thinking of sending their child uh, to Roland Unified School District, there's a good opportunity on Saturday, February 3rd, to come to the community center here from 10 to 1. And we're going to be uh, having our annual uh, Roland Unified School District showcase from creative learning to displays to um, projects that students have done in the past year. So if you're thinking of enrolling a student or you know somebody that is, be sure to have them come here on February 3rd from 10 to 1, and they can see everything that Roland's all about. Um, I don't know, were very many of you here last month when um, we had this meeting? Uh, Carrie Chen from our school board was here, and he showed um, and talked about the two Golden Bell Awards that Roland Unified received this year, which is one of the highest awards that a school district can achieve. So Roland Unified is really, um, acquiring a lot of awards, a lot of recognitions, and we are proud to show it off and we'll be showing it off on February 3rd. And one reminder is that um, on Monday, January 15th, it's um, Martin Luther King Day, and the district office and the schools um, will be closed on that day. And that's it. Any questions for David? One question. Uh, Mr. Mountainville, you mentioned about the uh, Roman Unified School District uh, coming into the 21st century. Does that mean that uh, the district is going to start recording and posting the recording of the, of the board meetings uh, like other districts uh, so that I can retire from that object? Anybody that's in the audience here is welcome to attend our board meetings. Uh, we'll be having one next uh, week from this Thursday, and you're welcome to come. And if you miss it, you can always see Mr. Humphrey's uh, videotape of it. Thank you. Any other questions? Big Yellow Bus Program. And the Big Yellow Bus Program 
is something that goes on all year long. So, and it's a 501c3. So if you want to recognize a special event or an occasion or honor somebody, you can always make a donation to the Big Yellow Bus Program. And the money goes directly to Worldling Unified if you specify that. And I have donation cards if you ever need any. And um, you can honor somebody. And then when we have the um, actual county fair, they will recognize those people that have donated. So uh, recently I've noticed that um, uh, great schools have uh, lowered their ratings for a number of schools in the Roland District. Uh, for example, Killian and Alvarado. Uh, do you know what the cost for that is? I'm not too sure what, when you say lower the ratings. We, the dashboard came out, and that's what they use now to rate the schools. And within Roland Unified, the, the dashboard um, is a new program that they have where they rate the schools and there's different colors from yellow <laughs> to red to green and um, the only um, if you if you rate um, red or a certain level then you're under watch by LA County and the only group that was not put on watch but just put on you know um, observation was our special needs students um, for graduation rate and that was the only one, um, that's the only group that was put on, you know, uh, observation. Well, it, it was, the ratings are for each individual school. Um, so, no, right, right, right. And the special needs um, children are at the continuing, at the um, day school, that's, that's down from the district office and um, the graduation rate and the length of time, I believe, they were there, they were put on observation. Do you have anything more on that, man? Or, you know, it was that one group of students that, what we need to do is we need to look at special needs students. When I say special needs, these are students that have emotional behavioral problems or severe um, disabilities. And, um, right, just for information real quickly, when the student um, ages out from high school, we're responsible, the school district's responsible for those students up through age 21. So we have a school just down the district, by the district office, where those students attend. And we need to find out why they're not graduating with a certificate sooner, why they're continuing through age 21. Well, we have the district office is looking into that now. David? You were talking to him on the outside. I need to move the program along. Thank you. As I'll say here for uh, Assembly Member uh, Phil Chan. Hi, everyone. I'm Gazal, and I won't take up much of your time. Um, I just wanted to report that we have a hike with the Assemblyman coming up this Saturday from 10 a.m. to 1130 a.m. at the barn at the Chino Hills State Park. And then um, for the next two months, we have a workout event in February. The date has not been confirmed just yet. And we also have a public safety event in March. So by the next meeting, I believe I'll be able to have flyers to pass out to all of you. Thank you. Any uh, questions for Gazal? Thank you, Gazal. Okay, uh, how many of you received, had a chance to look at the 15-page document, I think it was, sent out uh, earlier this week regarding the marijuana issue, the recommendations that are being made by the, the uh, <laughs> not very many hands up, okay, that's disappointing. <laughs> uh, we have uh, from the Office of Cannabis Management, we have uh, two speakers today, Max Thielander and Julia Orozco. She's going to, the Office of the Cannabis Management is responsible for developing a set of recommendations to the Board of Supervisors for what they should do with respect to the legalization of marijuana in the unincorporated areas. They've developed that, came out in this document that we sent out and um, the board is going to take their recommendations under consideration January 23rd, so it's coming up right away. So we ask the office to, to uh, come and 
present those recommendations and give the community a chance to ask questions about what the recommendations are. So, uh, I don't know which one of you can start out. Hello everybody, I'm Julia Orozco. I work for the Chief Executive Office of LA County in the Office of Cannabis Management. And as um, shared, you know, we're here today to present some information on the latest updates. And we've been here in the past, and I think it was in May, and we came to discuss the fact that the Board of Supervisors directed the Chief Executive Office and all related departments to come back to the Board of Supervisors with some recommendations on uh, ca the county's cannabis uh, legislation. So. presentation specifically for this community because we know that you've been you know, actively participating and we've made a presentation in the past and we've also held listening sessions in this community during the month of uh, when do we have our, when do we have the most that is it July or August? August. Early August. So we, we this is a continu a continuation of that conversation that we've been having with not just this community but all the communities on the unincorporated area of Los Angeles. Uh, this is an overview of our presentation. These are some of the issues that we're going to address. Why are we preparing uh, regulations for commercial cannabis? How did we determine what regulations to recommend? How do our proposed regulations address the community's concern? What are the next steps? And then, of course, we'll discuss some questions and you know try to answer some of the questions that are asked to the best of our ability. <clears throat> so we'll to get started with why. Are we preparing regulations for commercial cannabis? And for that, we'll provide a little bit of background. I know that in the past couple of meetings, we provided some background in terms of you know why we are where we are right now. But we'll just go ahead and uh, review that a little bit more. Um, background on state cannabis laws. In 1996, California voters approved the Compassionate Use Act, which legalized cannabis for use for qualified medical patients. That was a while ago as you can see, okay? We're pretty much coming up on a good, what, 20 years? 22 years? From 1996 to 2015, the state legislature never enacted a regulatory scheme for the sale of medical cannabis. So that kind of left it legalized for medical use, but just kind of out there with no rules or regulations on how the sales would occur. What happened? Cannabis businesses have proliferated despite multiple bans. Until recently, nearly all cities in LA County, including unincorporated areas, prohibited cannabis businesses. Despite these prohibitions, for example, in LA City, they did an estimate in July 2017 that over 1,500 unlicensed businesses operate within LA City. Now, of course, that's partially due to the fact that they did have Proposition D, which provided some immunity to about 135 dispensaries. But of course, you know, when people see, oh, well, they're able to do it, I can do it too. And so then people started opening up and now they got to have this huge problem. <clears throat> In LA County Unincorporated area, we have 75. And that includes all areas across the entire county of Los Angeles. And they're unlicensed. And I don't know if you recall from our previous meetings, we shared that the Board of Supervisors asked to come up with you know, a task force that would address these issues, and they were aggressively addressed. But it, was, it turned out we learned something, the county learned something when they did that, and basically, we call it the whack-a-mole effect, okay? From April to November, it may look like nothing was done. <laughs> From April to November, there was some pretty aggressive enforcement going on in an incorporated area, and they were able to close 29 of those 75 unlicensed dispensaries but 31 new ones opened, okay? So regardless of the fact that there were all these resources dedicated in a team to shut these down, you don't go into the details here, but basically, before we get started on this next slide, I just wanna share the fact that, you know, it's a very lucrative business, and there's a lot of uh, landlords who get paid cash from these businesses a lot of cash. And so basically what happens is they get leases very easily, okay? 
And that's really challenging because it's kind of like when you evict a tenant, it takes a while, there's a process, you have to go to court and all of those steps. It's the same for cannabis businesses. And so that is part of the delay and, and the challenge in trying to go through the due process to get them out of where they're at. Okay, so unlicensed businesses are more likely to locate in residential areas and near schools or other sensitive uses. Be operated by criminal gangs. Sell to minors, sometimes even employ minors, to be honest. Many youth report that getting cannabis is easier than getting alcohol or cigarettes. During our process, we've had multiple working groups. One of our working group is uh, youth prevention, intervention, education. We've had some focus groups with youth, and that's we can attest that that is one thing that they consistently report. The cannabis is much easier to access. Right now, if, you know, we're in 2018 now, it's quote unquote legal, but this is, these are, these, this happened when everything was banned and illegal. This is what the youth are reporting. <clears throat> they operate in ways that bother neighbors and those living close by. Now, what was the purpose of Prop 64? Voters approved it in November of 2016. And the stated purpose in the, in the, in the state, in the actual legislation is, um, I'm sorry, the measure, not legislation, take non-medical marijuana production and sales out of the hands of the illegal market and bring them under a regulatory structure that prevents access by minors, protect, protects public safety, public health, and the environment. That's a direct quote from the actual measure. Based on the state regulations that have been released, you know, and the proposals that are being discussed right now, cannabis is, will be highly regulated compared to what we're looking at right now. Uh, starting January 1st, the industry will be one of the most highly regulated industries in the entire state of California. There are security requirements, employee badging, people have to get life scan like when they get hired for, you know, government jobs. There's cameras, licensed security personnel. There's a track and trace system. What that is is basically from the moment the plant is basically a clone, very small, it has to get tagged. That tag gets followed all the way to when the sale gets made. And that the purpose of that is basically twofold. One is, of course, to track it for you know, purposes of collecting um, taxes. But the other part of it, in my opinion, the most important part of it is to prevent diversion to the legal market so that the cannabis that's being grown as part of the system doesn't then get sent out of state or, or, in, or some kind of other illegal activity. Uh, preventing sales to minors. So there's a lot of legislation that was added after the proposition was passed to, to try to prevent um, sales to minors and marketing to minors. There's uh, rules on advertising and marketing there's rules on banking and cash. And the most important, probably the most relevant for this group is local control. So basically what that means is that the state set uh, uh, this level of standards. Um, the, the local jurisdictions, whether it's a city or a county, can go down or go up on pretty much all of the rules. The majority of them, not all of them, I think. The majority of the rules. Give you an example. In uh, San Francisco, you know, the state says that you have to, you must be 600 feet from a school. In San Francisco, they reduced that to, was it 250, 300? 250, I think, 250 feet from schools. And the reason they did that is because they wanted to allow a regulated market, but because they're so dense and small and stacked, that if they had 600 feet, they would not be able to allow any businesses. So that's what they did. We're doing something different. We're proposing, not we're doing Let me restate that, I'm not scared, but we're proposing something different. Nothing gets done until the Board of Supervisors says that it's a policy and votes on it, okay? Okay, local control, local government can apply more restrictive regulations, that's what I just stated. Uh, dual licensure, state businesses will need both a state license and a local license. Um, another example that might give you some peace of mind um, is the state basically will notify all the jurisdictions when somebody applies for a license. We've already had two um, licensees that apply for a state license that are located not in this community, in an in, in unincorporated area in LA County. We were notified, we let them know. It can't happen. We, we still have a bad place. 
Therefore, no, we, we, we are asking that the state deny the license. So that's the situation and that's how we're working in partnership with the state in terms of who gets into the market and who does not. Now, the Board of Supervisors, uh, basically last year, directed the Office of County Staffing to conduct public outreach and work with the county departments to prepare rules for licensing and regulating cannabis businesses. And they set some priorities, and those were transition from an unlicensed market to a regulated market, protect county neighborhoods, prevent over-concentration and ensure equity in sitting, and that basically means um, no, not too many in one community. No particular community should be adversely impacted by this policy. Reduce crime, consumer protection, and, and a few other things, I think, but these are, these are the ones that matter the most to community. Julia? So as Julia just mentioned, uh, in the Board of Supervisors motion from February of last year, uh, they identified a number of priority areas uh, that our regulations uh, needed to address. And in addition to those, we then uh, conducted an extensive process of public engagement over the summer, uh, which included uh, over three dozen town halls and public workshops. Uh, we were here uh, in May of last year to give a uh, initial briefing uh, on some of the issues that we'd be looking at in our process to develop regulations. And then in early August, uh, we had a listening session uh, in this very space, actually uh, the next room down. Uh, but we had a listening session here in Roland Heights on a Saturday morning. Uh, we had 20 listening sessions altogether uh, throughout the county's unincorporated communities. Uh, there was one in Hacienda Heights as well, and uh, two in unincorporated Whittier. Uh, we tried to spread them evenly throughout the county, and these were on uh, both Saturday mornings and weekday evenings uh, to give people uh, a variety of opportunities. Um, and in addition to that, uh, I should say these were all uh, led by professional facilitators. Uh, we had uh, prepared questions and background information that we provided at each listening session on a number of different topics. And all of that input was uh, recorded. We had a recorder at each station, and all of that input uh, was taken uh, and recorded and compiled into a report, uh, which we have then used to inform our regulations. Uh, so this just explains uh, in brief uh, the purpose of the public engagement, um, which is number one, to inform and educate the public on the issues that we're looking at, the legal context, uh, the different trade-offs that are involved with different policy directions, uh, and then uh, once enough information uh, has been given uh, to provide the basic context. We asked for people's uh, desires and concerns, uh, what they would like to see or not see in commercial cannabis regulations. Um, and that was the uh, purpose of the listening sessions. And the third one is really what happened after the conclusion of the listening sessions. As I mentioned, all of that feedback from all 20 listening sessions countywide was compiled into a very large report, uh, a couple hundred pages long actually, uh, which is available on our website. And that was then used, it has been used uh, for the last several months since the listening sessions concluded uh, by county staff, including our office and a number of other departments uh, to develop the regulations uh, which we are now proposing. So in terms of the type of feedback that we heard uh, from community members, uh, in most communities uh, there was a mix. Uh, and often uh, the feelings tend to be very strong on either one side or the other in favor of or against legalization. Uh, many people welcome it, and uh, many others are very concerned about what it will mean uh, for their families and for their communities. And uh, I would say that uh, it's really hard to uh, stereotype in any way. Uh, all different uh, uh, communities and different socioeconomic classes uh, had different concerns, and there's really no generalizations. Uh, other than that, uh, feelings were very diverse. As I mentioned, uh, that report is available online. Uh, and the number one concern that we've heard really from all communities throughout the county is with the illegal dispensaries. Uh, as you may know, we have had a ban on dispensaries and all commercial cannabis activities in the unincorporated counties since 2010. Uh, however, in spite of that, uh, a number of them, uh, it would take 75 at any given time, uh, has existed and has uh, been difficult to enforce against for a variety of reasons. Uh, the slowness of the legal system, uh, the uh, lack of 
severe criminal penalties. We're mostly talking about civil penalties. And as Julia mentioned, it does a, a lucrative business. And so uh, given the uh, incentives and disincentives, uh, a number of people have chosen that it's worth the risk to offer the business uh, in spite of the uh, which makes the problem very difficult to get a handle on. Um, and as you can probably uh, imagine, you're probably very well aware, these illegal dispensaries do cause a number of problems public health and safety, as well as this general quality of life in the communities. Uh, they are often located in areas where we would not want to see them located, so residential areas, uh, next to schools, daycare centers, and places where youth congregate. Uh, they are often uh, involving uh, some element of organized crime. They may uh, have connections to gangs. Uh, the uh, profits may be funding gang activity, um, or they may just be uh, attractive to uh, due to the large amounts of cash that are offered on the site, or the valuable product, um, or just the fact that it's a, a psychoactive drug. Um, and there's often, as we've seen in many communities, uh, an over-concentration of these businesses. Uh, often you'll see uh, four or five uh, within uh, a mile stretch of commercial street. Uh, and obviously, uh, that's not the type of concentration that we would like to see. Uh, and largely as a result of that, and the way that these businesses are operating, they do create a number of nuisance impacts, uh, in addition to the public health and safety impacts. So things like loitering, uh, people consuming cannabis uh, in the parking lot. Um, and I should just uh, back up, uh, in case anyone is wondering, cannabis and marijuana, we do use more or less interchangeably. Um, we are using cannabis now to follow the uh, state. So concerns that we heard specifically in Roland Heights uh, were uh, similar to what we heard in other communities. The over-concentration of uh, the cannabis stores and dispensaries, both referring to the existing illegal ones and the potential for that over-concentration to continue into the future with a regulated industry. Uh, there's a uh, concern, um, as we've seen called out in the agenda for this meeting, uh, that Roland Heights will become the drug capital of the East St. Gabriel Valley. Um, Impacts on youth are another major concern. I think uh, this is obvious to anyone who's a parent, but you don't need to be a parent to understand uh, that the increasing uh, exposure and accessibility of cannabis to youth creates uh, a lot of problems. And we have uh, evidence that excessive cannabis use uh, by people from a young age does cause a number of developmental uh, problems. Hello? Uh, so we've, uh, we've heard a lot of concerns about impacts on youth. Uh, crime and public safety as well, as I mentioned, um, the, the large amounts of cash and the nature of the product uh, can uh, invite crime in certain circumstances. Nuisance issues with quality of life, with odor from uh, consuming in public, loitering, littering, and so on. Um, and another theme that we heard throughout the, command, the county is that residents would like to say, if the county does go forward to allow commercial cannabis businesses and activities, uh, residents uh, in all different types of communities strongly uh, express the desire to have some say in how these businesses operate, uh, where they locate, and who is allowed to operate them. And so now I'll just briefly uh, run through what we are proposing as far as regulations and how we feel it addresses these community concerns. And to put this in context, uh, these regulations would apply for all unincorporated counties throughout the uh, county. And I'm sure you're aware uh, that these county uh, communities are very diverse, uh, everywhere from Florence Firestone to the Antelope Valley, to Rowan Heights. So we have urban, suburban, rural, different socioeconomic and different uh, uh, conditions on the ground. Um, and so it is always a challenge. Uh, I actually came from the Department of Regional Planning, and I know it's always a challenge of uh, any county-wide regulation to have something that works for everyone. Uh, but what we are proposing, uh, first and foremost, is a discretionary process for businesses to be approved. Uh, some of you may be familiar with the conditional use permit process, and this would be more or less similar to that, uh, but it would be broader because it would be considering not only land use factors, uh, but other factors. Uh, such as who would be operating the business, uh, who will be hiring, uh, and so on. Uh, it would uh, cut across public health, public safety, um, and a number of departments would be involved in reviewing these applications. Um, we are proposing the establishment of a new commission, the Canvas Commission, uh, which would be similar to the Planning Commission. It would be five members, uh, one appointed by each of the five supervisors. 
and uh, they would be responsible for holding public hearings, and uh, uh, they would be authorized to either approve or deny an application, and also to impose any conditions that are needed to mitigate the impacts. So for example, uh, if there is, uh, if the analysis shows uh, that there is concern with, uh, say, late night activity in certain areas, the hours of operation could be limited uh, for that particular business. Or if, uh, um, if there's a concern about youth access or uh, what kids are doing after school, perhaps the business uh, need to contribute uh, to the existing number of unlicensed ones. And uh, moreover, they could not be con uh, concentrated or clustered in any one community. Uh, and the Cannabis Commission, uh, one of their most important uh, tasks would be to ensure that that did not happen. Uh, they could, for example, be uh, required to make a finding that approving a business in a certain location would not result in that kind of over concept. It has to do with zoning and buffers from sensitive uses. Uh, sensitive uses are schools, daycare centers, parks, and libraries. Uh, generally, uh, places where you'd expect uh, youth and children to congregate. Uh, we are, in our proposal, all cannabis businesses, uh, stores, and all others would need to be at least 1,000 feet away, as the crow flies, uh, from schools, and 600 feet from daycare centers, public parks, and public libraries. Uh, they would also need to be a certain distance away from other types of uses to avoid uh, sort of light impacts, so that would include other cannabis stores, uh, off-site alcohol retailers, uh, AKA liquor stores, and uh, they would also need to be at least 600 feet from drug and alcohol uh, rehab or treatment centers. So, uh, as I mentioned, we're well aware that the existing unlicensed dispensaries are a major problem and a major concern uh, throughout the county. And as one of our proposals, we have uh, put forward a strategic plan to eliminate the unlicensed cannabis businesses. And this would be done really in tandem uh, with licensing of legal businesses, uh, as we're imagining now. And this strategic plan would include uh, developing new approaches and tactics beyond the direct enforcement. Uh, we have our MMDET, which is a Medical Marijuana Dispensary Enforcement Team. That includes District Attorney, uh, Sheriff's Department, County Council, several other departments. And they are uh, the ones who are charged with shutting down these unlicensed dispensaries. Uh, that will most likely continue to be the case, but this would really be supplementing what they're doing. And hopefully, uh, by drawing on additional tactics beyond the direct enforcement, uh, we would have uh, more success and faster success in these kind of tasks. Um, one example of a component of the strategic plan is uh, something that we're calling our Uniform Emblem Program. And some of you are probably familiar with the letter grades that restaurants throughout the county have, uh, which has community standards district with regional planning, and uh, there have been uh, other communities in the county that have expressed a desire for a plan. Uh, our charge from the Board of Supervisors as the Office of Campus Management was to develop regulations that would bring some order to the existing unregulated market, uh, and to address all of these issues uh, with the existing ones uh, that we've discussed as far as over-concentration, public health and safety. Uh, and as I mentioned, one of the main challenges that we face is that these regulations need to work for all communities countywide. And uh, you know, we've heard a lot of very diverse feedback, uh, both for and against legalization, um, and different types of concerns from those who are uh, on the against side. Could, could you please hold that mic up again? You're starting to fade. I'm sorry. Uh, thank you for the reminder. Uh, and so uh, it has been a challenge to find something that balances all the different concerns and interests that and that works for all communities, uh, but we do feel that what we have proposed um, does balance those as best as possible. <coughs> and so I'll turn it back over to Julia now to talk about where we go from here. When this proposal was developed, we drafted a war letter and it will go before the Board of Supervisors. In December 2017, our office released the proposed policies for regulation of commercial cannabis in unincorporated areas. The Board of Supervisors is very committed to receiving as much public input as possible on this matter. Normally, when a board letter goes before the board, it's basically to, we, you get the board agenda, you find out when it's on the board agenda. In this case, we posted it online, basically a good month ahead of time before it shows up. And um, we don't know what's gonna happen on that day, we just know it's gonna be on the agenda. And 
you know, sometimes the board decides that, you know, they want to continue the discussion, so it's not uncommon when our office proposes a policy, especially one that's this important and this, you know, this type of change, that they, you know, they, they, they put it on hold and they continue to discuss, you know, for a few weeks before the final approval or non-approval of the issue, just to give everybody a heads up. The recommendations were developed jointly with all the different departments, regional planning, public health, the treasury tax collector, and they reflect close and ongoing consultation with the sheriff, the district attorney, our county council, fire department, public works, agriculture commissioner weights and measures, among those are just a few. The Board of Supervisors is expected to consider these uh, recommendations in February of 2018. Um, again, we think um, we're gonna, we, we've pushed it forward for January 23rd, for the January 23rd agenda. However, you know, this discussion may go on. And just wanna give, and I always like to give people a heads up about that because, you know, many times when we uh, propose a policy and people are in the, under the impression that it's gonna be finite and the final solution will occur on that date. But again, many times things come up, you know, in the middle of the testimony that makes the board say, wait a minute, let's look into that before we move forward. So. That's, I think that's why we've, um, we've said February. If the board approves the proposed policies, the next step would be to prepare ordinances to, to um, implement these policies. So just to make a distinction for everyone, um, since it's such a delicate and complicated issue, the strategy that was basically proposed is to come up with some high-level policies. You know, these are the policies that we think, you know, we recommend to the board based on the input we receive from everyone you know, in the community, including the Board of Supervisors. If the board, you know, decides that those policies, you know, they, they work, they work, then basically what happens is, even if they approve on that day, that's still, there's still an opportunity to continue the discussion because we have to prepare ordinances. So nothing is the law of the land in the unincorporated county until it's actually an ordinance. Just so I just want to give people that, um, Hit a, you know, piece of information if you don't have, you know, that experience of working on something, you know, like this with the board, you know, just know that even if approved on, the, let's say, on January 23rd, they say, oh, it's wonderful, it's great, let's move forward. That doesn't mean that the next day people are going to start, you know, issuing licenses. There's still going to be a discussion ongoing in terms of exactly how that's going to occur, what ordinances and what changes in our, in our, in our ordinance and our code need to, needs to occur in order to implement all those policies. So just to give everybody a heads up about that. And that timeline, if we were to get, if this were to get approved, um, the day it gets introduced, um, basically we're talking around May, June, okay? Okay, detailed descriptions of each proposed policy can be found on our website. I think everybody at this point has probably gotten an email from, from your leader on on what our website is. <laughs> maps, there's maps showing where the businesses could potentially locate. And it says, no businesses must be approved via a discretionary process. Just because the area is available does not mean a business will locate there. What are the different types of licenses that you're going to issue and where they could be uh, zoning wise? Uh, commercial cultivation, which is uh, along, along the lines of the uh, direction from the Board of Supervisors uh, not to allow outdoor. Uh, we would have two types of manufacturing license. One uh, that actually does the manufacturing. Uh, and manufacturing, for those who don't know, uh, is converting the uh, flower or the leaf product into an edible product or some other form. Uh, there are various uh, manufactured products uh, and ever growing. Uh, there would also be a processor license. Uh, that would only allow the packaging and repackaging and labeling. Uh, we would have two types of distributor license. Uh, a transporter only license and a distributor general license. Uh, distributors under the state law, they do have to be responsible uh, for transporting cannabis between uh, wholesale entities. So from the cultivation to the manufacturing facility, or the cultivation to the retail facility. Uh, this is different from delivery to the actual customer. Um, we have two retail licenses. Uh, one is a retail store, which is the familiar uh, dispensary. And then there would be a delivery-only retail license, uh, which would be uh, sort of like a warehouse or a fulfillment center. It would not be open to the public, uh, but they would be authorized to deliver uh, to um, people's residences. 
uh, we would have two types of micro business license. And a micro business, this is also something uh, that was created by state law, uh, allows for any combination of these uh, activities, such as cultivation and manufacturing and retail, uh, but all on a limited scale, uh, sort of the cottage industry idea. Um, and then there's a lab testing license. Uh, all cannabis does need to be lab tested and cannabis products before they can be sold to the end consumer. Uh, so that would just be the testing lab uh, for that is done. Um, and I'm sorry, your other question was where they would be allowed to locate? <laughs> Distribution uh, and micro business, because it could include any of those, would be allowed only in the industrial zones, which are the M zones, M1, M1.5, and M2. Uh, they would also be subject to the distance requirements that I mentioned, uh, 1,000 feet from schools, uh, 600 from daycare, libraries, uh, and parks. And, uh, and other cannabis businesses as well. Okay, before uh, we turn it over to general questions, I'm going to think the chair will uh, ask one to start things off. Um, I looked at the map for the fourth district that you have on your website. It's got colored in yellow for unincorporated areas. It also has C3 properties in red. When you look at the San Gabriel Valley, about the only C3 properties are in Roland Heights. Since our, the cities surrounding us are all prohibiting it, uh, Hacienda Heights doesn't appear to have any C3 properties. It appears to me that means all of the retail stuff's going to end up in Roland Heights and we're going to get all the problems. So uh, you are correct that in the uh, fourth district, uh, I believe the majority uh, of the C3 land is here in Roland Heights. Um, I would just point out that uh, retail businesses could also locate in any of the industrial zones, uh, number one, um, and also uh, that actually two uh, other things. The number of it uh, would be another way to limit the number of these businesses and uh, the concentration. And then thirdly, uh, and perhaps most importantly, the Cannabis Commission, um, one of their most important jobs would be to avoid that over-concentration. And so even if we are allowing four in the fourth district and all of the available zone land were here in Roland Heights, uh, I don't believe the Cannabis Commission would approve four licenses here because that would be uh, probably an over-concentration that would be counter to that uh, objective. Another, just a comment, um, Prop 64, in Roland Heights was 54% uh, against, 46% for. If it was a uh, presidential election, they would call that a landslide. Uh, it doesn't seem right that the commission is trying to force this community to have something that, uh, you know, we've had four or three meetings on this now. The, and we get pretty good cross-section of the community coming out to, to our meetings. Uh, and they've expressed 99% <laughs> that they're opposed to this. And we don't understand why you're trying to force it into our area. When we don't want it, we clearly showed that the majority of the people don't want it. The fact that uh, you say you don't want it to concentrate in other areas, you want to spread out. So you want to spread the crime and all the problems evenly. Well, you're afraid that if it concentrates in another area, you're going to have undue health problems, undue health. You don't have to put more in an area than what uh, you know, will fit. There's an area that wants it, that's fine, let them have it. But it doesn't mean you have to put 10 stores there. If only one should fit there, that's all that should go there. It's almost like the commission is saying, oh, we have to have this many stores because we need that tax money and that uh, therefore it has to be spread out so that, that we don't have uh, you know, too bad of a uh, result in any one community. Well, certainly, uh, I, I am well aware and appreciate uh, your concern and the community's concern. And I don't doubt uh, that you are uh, speaking for the majority of people here. Um, I, I think a lot of the challenge that we face is uh, having to have regulations that work throughout the county. Um, in terms of the number, uh, I think that was driven not so much by the tax revenue as by uh, concern of the existing uh, market demand. Um, and uh, I think the thinking was that if it were more restrictive, uh, if it were not uh, sufficient to supply uh, 
Amendon and how we can end uh, and we'll continue to have the problem with this. There is no problem with the demand. They can buy it from Amazon. They were everything for the need for Christmas from Amazon. You know, if there's people in the community that wants it, they're going to be able to get it. Why do you have to force the retail here? Because when you do that, it's going to be damaging to the kids. You know? the, the, yeah. the more you have it around, I see the parents uh, smoking it, see the other kids getting it, you know, that's going to have a very detrimental impact on whatever community it goes into. Now, if other community wants that, you know, so be it for it. But, uh, but we don't want it here. The majority of them can't say I talked for everybody and said talking for the majority. The community has made that clear, and that's definitely part of the message. You know, we are, you know, we're not in commission yet. You know, we're, like I said, in the Office of Cannabis Management, and we respond to directives of the Board of Supervisors. So the directive was come up with a proposal. That proposal, again, like I said earlier, might change. You know, they, I think that the message has been delivered, you know, not just Rolling Heights, there are various other communities that feel strongly. Um, but one of the things in just analyzing and looking at this particular issue that, you know, I personally have found is that the majority of, of the communities, even though they don't want it, you know, have some, some type of unlicensed business. Some have more than others, but the unlicensed business is there. And we and we really, we really are doing our best, you know, to to you know try to go go through the judicial system, trying to get the resources of the sheriff, you know, to target, you know, some of these businesses. And like I said, we've been successful. But we haven't achieved true success again because the, the market is there. The market is there and in, in all including in this community. And when, and when we shut them down, there's always landlords that are willing to lease next door or a block away. And so we, we're continuing to face that issue. So I think that, honestly, honestly, um, I don't know if this is a solution, but what I do know, what I do know 100% is that for the entire county of Los Angeles, not, not Roland Heights particularly, you know, Regardless, these unlicensed businesses are going to continue to open. Well, I, you know, so I, so we need to think about you know what are some creative ways to try to you know what about those businesses are making us upset? What about those businesses are imposing that negative impact? And how do we restrain it and control some of that? It's naive, naive yeah. to think you're going to shut down the unlicensed business. They're not going to have the tax. They're going to be able to sell cheaper than the licensed business. If you could control that, you would have already controlled it. You, you, you say you're going to have this plan to shut down these unlicensed businesses. Why didn't you do it up to this point? Yeah. What prevented you from doing it? I, I, to be honest, you know, this is, I'm, I'm, I think all of us here are relatively new to this issue. You know, we just started as soon as Prop 64 passed. But well, one thing I will say is that this issue is one of those that needs some kind of vent. You know? It needs a vent. You know, unfortunately, it's not one of those things where you just stop it and it stops. It, it doesn't. It just keeps popping its head, you know, everywhere. And so, and so the, every jurisdiction that we've been looking at, the grand majority, you know, it turns out that they are consistently fighting in licensed businesses, like perpetually, this ongoing. So I guess what I'm trying to say is that even if there's a ban, it'll be a ban on paper, but they're still, they're still, they're still there. It seems to me like what you're really doing is recruiting new customers for the hotels. <laughs> no, 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 oh, no, we're not recruiting. I'm no. serious about no, it. No, no, no. <laughs> you ask any police officers, don't be so uh -oh. this marijuana, whatever we want to call it, in Long Beach. So opposed that he was able to get their city council to enact a ban on not want it at all. And what happened was that the industry funded an entire campaign and an initiative that got passed by the people. And now their, their hand was forced 
and they have to have 2732 retail shops in the city of Long Beach, and they don't have any limits because they lost control once they went into the initiative. They don't have they don't have any limits on cultivation. They don't have any limits on manufacturing at all. So there's some major speculation going on in that city, and the city has not that dust right now. But we've got oh, let, let me finish. Let me finish. Had only the, risk, left. the risk that we take, the risk, and this is a real risk. I'm not. Sure. And again, everything is speculation. We don't know, but it's a potential. Any ballot measure that goes on the county ballot for any corporate areas has to be voted on by the entire county of Los Angeles. It can't be voted on just by an incorporated area. When that happens, and we looked at what happened with Prop 64, if you look at the county-wide numbers, it would pass. Okay? So we have to like walk a very fine line in a tightrope in terms of what we want to achieve. So those are the challenges, I think, and the information that's before the board that needs, that we'll look at this, we'll look at some of that data, and try 